Okay, let's get started again. Um, we are now in the part of the program where we're getting closer to the end of this conference. Um, and for this next session, we've asked uh, three people to provide some short reflections on the theme of movement and maps, which is also the theme of, of the day. Um, I think the undertitle was Told and Untold Stories of the Future. And the first reflection is uh, by Palatil, who is a dear friend of me and of Samus. And one of, uh, well, what could we say about Pella? She's one of Sweden's most influential activists, I would say, uh, working on issues spanning from nature's rights and ecocide, which we've been very involved with, but also working with the organization Ludin on eco-psychological approaches, so connecting to the talk by Renee this morning. Um, yeah, and we've worked a lot together, uh, not least with a conference here in Sigtuna, actually, about a year ago, on, on, it was, which was called an Earth Rights Conference, which I think is happening again next year as well. So it's sort of like the sister conference to this, one might say. It's the same place, but different topics and different entry points. So maybe we'll hear something about that now from Pella. So welcome, Pella. Thank you. That was great to hear it as a sister conference. I, I also experienced it like that. Great to be here. Um, I was pondering on uh, what, how, to, how, to, how to get all of this together, these lovely, expansive days that we've shared, and how, how, how I could add to that made me quite humble. But then suddenly, a, a character from long ago just popped into my mind quite unexpectedly. I don't know if you, if you um, recognize him. Do you recognize him? It's Jeff Goldblum. Actually, not Jeff Goldblum. But, um, in his role as the character Ian Malcolm of um, uh, the movie Jurassic Park. He's 25 years old or something. I was quite um, surprised that, that he would show up. Um, he is. Yeah, we bit. Oi da. Ah, okay, thank you, that's better. Um, he's the, the chaos mathematician in that film, and um, he's a real pain in the ass. He's spoiling the party when, when the billionaire, you know, John Hammond was his name, he was creating this dinosaur park, and he was happy as a kid on Christmas Eve, and then Ian Malcolm comes around, and he's like that guy on, on the party, you know, when you're planning your vacation, that suddenly comes and, and talks about climate change. Uh, do you know him? I think maybe that might be you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he lectures the others on, on chaos theory, saying that things that with a very, very low probability of happening, they do happen. Initial conditions have a real um, are, are, of, are of a huge importance, and he's very critical, of course, about this project of bringing creatures that went extinct a hundred, hundreds of millions of years ago to life. And he says that the lack of humility before nature that's displayed here staggers me. Of course, in the film, he's the voice of of truth, and uh, as as the control. Mechanisms all fall away. Uh, the dinosaurs, they were all female, but uh, still they managed to breathe. And um, they, uh, they get loose and they wreak havoc and chaos breaks out, that you, which you know if you saw the film. Um, and we heard here from several voices that the transition to a just, sustainable, harmonious, beautiful, insert your favorite adjective, society, uh, is, is possible, but it's not really likely. And um, when we base our hope on an assessment of probability, we have to do with a feeble, a super, superficial hope. 
But a lot of the hope in the sustainability discourse is like that. Um, we desperately, desperately cling to that hope, which is a hope of the, the analytical mind, the box head. And that's why we have to convince each other that solar energy is being installed now at record levels or that plastic bags are not being sold anymore. Or they, ha they are sold, they're not given away, so we don't use so many plastic bags. We have to convince ourselves that we have a great and important climate agreement, so we'll be okay. That hope doesn't take us to the depths that we need to explore. Because we will protect it by avoiding to look at the unraveling of life. We will protect it, our fragile hope, and, and when we do that, we don't take in the totality of our circumstances. We don't let the grief in. Probably we need to lose this hope. And I wonder, can we support each other in that loss? To find new hope somewhere else. Because there is another hope. The active hope. It's the kind of hope that's based not on likelihood, but doing something uniquely human. To make a choice. The kind of choice you would do if you had a very, very sick child. And where the chances of survival was maybe not so high. You wouldn't base your choice to sit with your child on the probability that she would survive. You would just do the only thing that you could do. You would sit there because of love. You would be so attached to life that you can stand being unattached to outcome. That's not the kind of hope you have. It's the kind of hope you act. Like the father did in the film that Jan showed us. Or he didn't show us, but he spoke about that film, La Vita e Bella. And uh, as Jan also said, that hope, the active hope, takes courage. It takes faith in, in a goodness that you can't yet really see. So the chances of a more beautiful world is diminutive, a very... Very small. Interesting thing is that what, what chaos thinkers like Ian Malcolm, what they tell us is that it's at the edge of chaos that the system really gets creative. That's where change really happens. The system finds new ways. Maybe climate change is the edge of chaos for our, cul our culture. Maybe it's our ordeal. As we show up to the reality of climate change, we also change. As we heard from Mary Oliver. Um, what did we hear? I have to have the right words. <laughs> you have to change your life. And maybe that sounds greater than it really is. Remember... Ian Malcolm's lesson that really small changes in initial conditions make a huge difference. There are phase shifts, you know, like ecosystems go into phase shifts. They also happen in us. And they are irre irreversible. So what we once held true and important shifts into something else. We, we shift what we hold true and important. So what kind of change are we talking about here? That's, of course, um, interesting. I suggest it's a, it's a change into a, a wilder mind, uh, a wilder self. And by wild, I mean a listening self, attentive to voices and needs within us and surrounding us. The eco-psychologist Nick Totton, he describes that the wild mind is spontaneous, it's embodied and self-balancing. It creates relationships and it, uh, it uh, develops increasing complexity. It's the wild mind which lets the soft animal of your body love what it loves. 
This takes practice. There are no shortcut, shortcuts. It also takes courage. You know what that word comes from, the etymology of courage? It comes from cœur, the French cœur, heart. Courage requires us to act from the heart. And as humans, we have a remarkable sensitivity and imagination. We can take perspectives of others, even creatures and phenomena like water, rocks, trees, the wind. With our wild self, we discover that we are always participants. We're never observers or managers, like they discovered the hard way in, in the film Jurassic Park. They, they became participants involuntarily. We discover the world anew, not to map for control, but continuously getting to know it, to encounter it with curiosity and respect. And um, I find it really, really interesting that uh, actually the Swedish church is the organization I've found that, that um, describes this way of being in the world most clearly. Uh, I, I did, um, they made a letter from the bishops on climate and I uh, made a translation of a part of it actually to Al Gore's daughter, Karen Gore, because I loved it so much and, and she did too. Um, and the headline of that part is People of Hope. And it comes after um, it, the text questions or, or challenges the idea of stewardship saying that, yeah, stewardship is an, it's an important Christian concept of how humans move in the world, but it's not enough. We have to find something else. So how do we live? How do we need to live to look after the life of creation? Jesus says something that seems to turn the usual order on its head. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for, for my sake, you will find it. What does that mean in relation to the climate challenge? This, perhaps. A person who derives his or her value from being... From being, from being, from being... At the top of a hierarchy, always needs to defend himself or herself, and has everything to lose. This is what happens if we human beings claim to be lords of creation. However, if we give up our position in favor of a relationship, we have something to gain. If we see our relationship with the rest of creation and with God, we lose our position at the center, as the center and measure of the universe and gain a community that involves trust, hope, and life. So by participating in life rather than controlling and dominating it, we take part and also we allow others to take part and to participate and to give their gifts. I think our survival as a species depends on how well we participate in life. Holding space for regenerative processes which make this planet such an abundant living whole. As systems thinker Dana Meadows put it, life is bursting forth, pushing, throbbing, aiming toward fertility, productivity, purity and the most astonishing beauty. It's an awesome force working in our direction if we would let it do so. And a lot of this is about the unlocking, I think, yeah, that René spoke about. So it's nothing that we have to, you know, really do or um, fix. We just have to unlock it. That's where the wild mind comes in. It's about digging deep within ourselves to find that we are so much more than we thought, that we have a vast wilderness within us that we can discover and how can we do that? How can we let, this, let us guide us here at the edge of chaos? 
What's the relationship between the wild creative force within and the wild creative force that's surrounding us? Let him be around here, Ian. Um, so what he said also mean, I mean, it means that chaos is very unlikely, but it can happen and it do happen. But that also means that miracles, they can also happen. And um, I think we need miracles in this time of chaos. A miracle is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as an extraordinary and welcome event that's not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore attributed to a divine agency. Imagine, I'm so fascinated that I, I was really, I really loved that character, Ian Malcolm, in that film. And I, I never knew why. And now, 25 years later, he comes back to explain that. Isn't that fascinating? Um, and this also means that we never know what we do that's of real, very big importance. Even small actions can have a large importance, and you never know. Um, but so miracles happen, uh, they are needed, they are possible, and they need someone to spot them. Or they may pass unnoticed. Some stories need to be listened into existence. Can we hold space for us? and for each other to listen to those stories and to tell those stories? Can we give each other permission to see the miracles in the cracks? Yeah, I saw it too. You're not crazy, I saw it. Uh, I know my time is up. I just wanted to end with uh, a poem by the indigenous North American poet. Louis Erdrich, life will break you. Nobody can protect you from that, and living alone won't either, for solitude will also break you with its yearning. You have to love. You have to feel. It's the reason you're here on earth. You're here to risk your heart. You're here to be swallowed up. And when it happens that you're broken or betrayed or left or hurt or death brushes near you, let yourself sit by an apple tree and listen as the apples fall all around you in heaps, wasting their sweetness. Tell yourself that you tasted as many as you could. Thank you. Thank you, Pella. That's a beautiful way to start these three talks um, and reflections. Um, our next speaker, or our next reflector, um, is Kevin Anderson, who we've already seen before. And the first time Kevin came to Uppsala, or actually the second time um, Kevin came, um, I think we asked him how he would like to be introduced. And he said, well, I don't like long introductions. Just call me Kevin from Manchester. So. I'd like to welcome Kevin from Uppsala up on stage. This, you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm um, sad to say that mine's not going to be quite as poetic as the last one. Um, probably because I'd, maybe I left it too late to think about it, but also I'd, I'd, I wasn't quite sure what we meant by, um, as an engineer, see things like reflections on movements and maps, told and untold told stories of the future. That's not a normal question we ask engineers. Um, so I was trying to think about this late last night. 
Um, and being a, an engineer, I like to compartmentalize things. So I sort of split it into two, like movement and maps, and then told and untold stories. So I'm going to try and pick some things out of there which have, um, have been triggered by a few of the things that I've, listened, I've heard whilst I've been here. But actually, I think it's interesting, the little, um, this little sort of subclause of the future, told and, unstored, told and untold stories of the future. I think it's not an unreasonable thing to, to start sort of telling stories of the past as well. So we, I think there are plenty of things that we can learn from the past. the past. The future is not the past. It's not an extrapolation of the past. But there are lessons from the past. The past is, a, is an heuristic for thinking about the future. So I think I, I would probably remove the of the future and I'll start by just, just telling stories, really, regardless of their um, particular time frame. But, um, the, the first part I'm going to focus on is movement, maps and movement. And um, this was my thoughts on that were mostly triggered by um, one of the side events I went to yesterday with... with um, Hiel, uh, who's talking, uh, is, that, is that how you pronounce his name? Or is he, is that? Shell. Shell. Yeah. Sorry, that was even easier. Shell, yesterday. And um, he spoke um, about, effectively he spoke about local tourism, about going to these wonderful um, cabins that are free. And as I'm half Scottish, that's quite attractive to me. So um, these free cabins that are um, in, the, in the countryside, the beautiful countryside of Sweden, that you don't have to go to Bali or Thailand or Paris or Rome. That actually you can just stay, you don't have to stay at home, but you can stay at home. You can, you can travel locally, and you can travel also um, by local forms of transport. You don't have to drive there. In fact, for the benefit of most of these places, you couldn't drive there. And if you did drive, you still find yourself 18 kilometers in a lake away from the place. So there was some adventure in getting there. And people often talk about when they say, I have to go somewhere else, it's the cultural adventure. Well, there's the adventure. And the culture will be, it won't just be with your own species, but with other species as you battle through the undergrowth to get there. Um, so... The other, but the other um, discussion that went on was, was around some, some work, really fascinating work in Iceland. Um, but that made me think about some of these issues as well, because Iceland obviously is a lot further away. Um, and I think these things are brought together through this whole idea that we, we move through landscapes. And I think if we, and going back to the, you know, the, to me, sort of the, the fundamental framing of this in relation to climate change, which is just one facet of sustainability, if we are to respond to the two degree C framing of climate change, and remember that we're not interested in the two degree C just sounds like it's something technical. The two degree C is a proxy for a set of impacts. And our concern with a set of impacts is that that is about people's lives. So when we talk about climate change and two degree centigrade, we're talking about people's lives. People's lives, our know, families, our children, people like us, you know, and poor people elsewhere. So although it sounds like a technical language, two degree C framing of climate change, what we're talking about are the lives and the quality of the lives and the deaths of, um, of, of people and other species indeed. So the way I was trying to think about this in relation to maps and movements is I think we have to change the radius, if this makes sense, the radius of our expectations and of our travel. And you change the radius. There's two ways of changing the radius. Well, maybe there are multiple ways. The two ways I thought about. One is spatial. You change the spatial radius and you reduce the spatial radius. So you cannot go as far. And for those who like going further, the second one will give you some leeway on this in a minute. So we have to change that radius. And if you change the radius, then, then our impacts are much, much, much smaller. Our climate impacts are much smaller. So rather than having to go to a cabin in Italy, we can go to a cabin somewhere in Sweden. So I think there's something there about the spatial dimension of the radius. But the other part is the temporal dimension of the radius. Actually, if we still want to go to the hut in Italy, or indeed in Bali, we can go there, but we have to go there slowly. Because as soon as you try to go fast, you use more energy. And also, when you go fast, it means that you, you have extra opportunity cost to use energy later on. The benefit about traveling slowly is whilst you're traveling slowly, you're not doing something else. The problem with going fast is that you get lots more time to do other things, and the other things will always have a carbon footprint. So we can either reduce the spatial radius or increase the temporal radius. So what does that mean in a, in, a, um, in a realistic sense? Well, when Darwin went to do some of the wonderful work he did on the Beagle, he wasn't popping out for a three-week field trip. You know, he was back a few years later, and then he went and did it again a few years later. We have to learn, as I said before, it's stories from the past. They're heuristics. What we're doing now, how we do what we do, is completely and utterly unsustainable. So I think that we have to start to rethink that. We have to th rethink the sort of temporal framing. Not rethink, but actually redo it. Rethinking, we're, we're great at rethinking. We're just not very good at acting. So we need to make the thinking into acting. So we need to recognize that if we're going to do field work, 
Maybe we do one year in three in the place that our field work needs to be done, rather than going three times a year. And we've normalized that. I hear that so regularly from academics who say, I've got to, this is my field work, I've got to go. Well, I'll go once and spend a year there. Don't go three times in each year. Or perhaps something really radical, because normally it's a white person going to somewhere else, somewhere more exotic. Um, perhaps help train some of the local people so they could do the field work for us. They could run the cameras for us. They could do the stories for us rather than think that a rich white colonial person has to go there and do it because the poor local people can't. I've had that discussion a lot with the BBC. Always fly there with a big film crew and sound crew and all the reporters think, can't black people report on their own lives? I mean, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're still doing that. And I have to say, I find it uncomfortable saying it, but watching David Shookman and others, um, when you do say it, they find it incredibly uncomfortable to, be said, uh, you know, to say that to them because they don't think of themselves like that. They're just, um, they're just colonials, really. Um, and the other thing about this, I often, one of the responses I've often heard when I discuss this whole, day, whole idea of the temporal dimension is that um, you know, we, we bring up this as your families. And I've had this a lot with colleagues of mine, close colleagues who are getting really well with, fortunately, so we can have these discussions. Um, they say, well, I've got my children. I've got to get back from my children. And you think, well, actually, if you unpick that, what, firstly, why are we privileging white children over black children? You know, why is it we have to get back for our children in the, in, over in the UK? But by doing that, we know that other children elsewhere are going to suffer, and those children will be typically poor a long way away and non-white. So they'll suffer the consequences of us coming back quickly to see our children. So we're privileging our families, our, our families' um, pleasure of spending time together over the other people's families' existential existence, their, their actual lives. The other part about that is that when we come back to see our own children, what we're doing is we're saying that what's important about our own children is our time with our own children. Because if we're not denialists, and I suggest we all probably are, but if we're not denialists, we know if we come back to spend time with our own children, when we're no longer here, and usually the parents, at least in modern times, the parents die before their children, when we're no longer here, our children will be suffering the repercussions of us coming back to see our children. So what we're doing is we're discounting our own children's future. So we don't care about people elsewhere, and we don't really care about our own children. We only care about our time with our own children. Now, I know that's a bit, that's a bit too black and white, but it is a natural way you can extrapolate that and come up to that sort of conclusion. So as we... Well, it's, well, it's universalizing, yeah. It's universalizing. Um, and we, no doubt we all, we all like to think we're the exception, that we don't do that. Um, so that was the bit around the, the maps and the movement, this idea of a, a spatial... Reducing the spatial radius or increasing the temporal radius. And the great thing about that, that gives us the balance. If you want to go a long way, that's fine. Just go slowly and take a long time. And I would argue it does give you a much richer cultural exchange, which is another one of the excuses we often use for fast travel, that we have to have cultural exchange. Traveling slowly is much culturally enriching, I think. Um, so the second part is on told and untold stories. I, mean, I, had, I made a list here, and actually, I, I, um, I'm right at the beginning, when Vanessa was speaking, I made a, she was making quite a lot of reference to sort of the knowns and the unknowns and so forth, and I really like that. Um, and I've never liked Donald Rumsfeld, who some of you will have heard of. Um, he was the previous uh, warmonger, sorry, uh, Secretary of Defense um, in the US government. So you, you're all familiar with Rumsfeld? You're, fam rum, you're familiar with his known unknowns and all that sort of thing? Yeah. So, well, in case some of you aren't, it, he, had, he made this famous comment um, it, and it was actually taken from other people's work earlier, as is usually the case, about the importance of, well, of recognizing the no, that we have known knowns. So we have known knowns. We have known unknowns, which are the sort of things that we, you know, we know there are things out there that we don't know. And then there are unknown unknowns as well. And, yeah, that's helpful to remind ourselves, and I'll come back to that in a minute, because I also think it links to Jonas's and Erica's um, presentation last night in the side, in the side event. Um, but the other thing I think is actually most disturbing from a climate point of view, and significantly I relate this to the scientists and the engineers, there are also a whole load of unknown knowns. And the unknown knowns are the things that we as scientists and engineers do, along with economists, when we hide the scale of the challenge behind things like negative emission technologies, geoengineering. These things, up until very recently, were known about by those of us working in the field, but we didn't speak about them with anyone else. So that they were unknown knowns. In other words, a privileged few who do the modeling hid them from other people. And we hid them for good reasons, because we didn't really want to scare everyone about the scale of the challenge. So we 
hid it behind some technical facade. So this, I think, is an additional to the comments to the, um, to, the, to the Rumsfeldian set of knowns, the unknown knowns, which a privileged few know, and they think they take a paternal view of the world and that they should hold that knowledge and other people should not know it. So that's a story that we know that others don't know. Then come to the, uh, the other part about the stories and um, told and untold is this idea of complexity. And I think that, that also, which was one of the side events yesterday, complicated than complexity. And I think that wraps also into this idea of, of knowns. So you know, the, in complexity, I think we broadly accept that there are no known solutions. If the system is complex, not just complicated, if it's complex, there are no solutions, not a known. There are responses. And the responses, in my view, are iterative. You respond knowing that actually you, you act and do something, knowing that the responses to that will be the th some things that you hadn't expected. So you have to iterate again. So, it's a con so there are no optimum policies. Optimization is a complete myth. In a complex system, you can't optimize. In a complex system, what, what do you learn from that? You say, well, we want to avoid locking in. You want to maximize the discussion, I think, one the, the, the one with the tree moving outside of its supports. You want, you want to maximize agility. You want to maximize resilience. Maybe maximize is the wrong word. You want to make sure they're embedded in some way. So I think the idea that we are, we are facing a complex problem, not a complicated problem, tells us quite a lot about what we need to do in terms of our policy realm. It doesn't say you shouldn't do nuclear or you shouldn't go for gas. Well, I wouldn't go for gas at all because it's high carbon. But the problem with those things, once you put them in place, you are locking yourself into very, very capitally intensive and institutionally intensive infrastructures. As if you use energy efficiency, you can change things very quickly. So if you recognize the system's complex, it tells you what it, it, it prioritizes sets of actions, actions that you know you can change, and you know, actions you know you can undo quite easily become really important. Um, another story that's not told, uh, I think, which is really important, and I don't know quite how we're going about doing this, or if we, perhaps we want to do it, but this is a really interesting group of people. I don't know how many people here work on the sort of science and engineering side of, of, of climate change. My guess is not very many of you. So what we're, what we're hearing here are stories that are told to yourselves and are not told to people involved in science and engineering, are not told probably to quite a lot of economists, are not told to quite a few policymakers. So I think that our stories need to be told to them, which means they need to be engaging in these events. This is another siloed event in that sense. Um, and of course, the other events that I go to, which are usually full of economic and climate modelers and technical people, their events are siloed as well. None of you are there. So I think the stories here are being told, but they're being told in parallel worlds. And those parallel worlds have to be brought together, and that will be uncomfortable. So I think you need to think about how do you bring some people in here, from the science community and the engineering community, who can start to talk about some of the technical issues, and then you can reflect on what you're saying means for them and what they are saying means for you. So it's, another, it's, a, um, it's an interaction of those stories. Um, and the two more things on these stories here. One on the cognitive dissonance. I think the other problem is that we also have in our own minds, you know, when I'm, when we're not a duality, we're probably a, a mul whatever the word would be, a multality, if there is such a word. Um, but we, you know, we, we run a dual, a dual life, at least. We, one part of our brain hears our stories, and the other part of the brain doesn't hear them at all. And I, I, sadly, I think the other part of the brain is one that brings about the actions. So we can, we can come to places like this, and we can... We can tell good stories to the one part of our brain that's happy to hear them, if you want the intellectual side, but the other part of our brain simply doesn't want to engage with that because it makes things uncomfortable, it makes things difficult. And that's the last thing that we want, or indeed anyone else wants. So there seems to be some sort of protection mechanism. So I think that's another set of stories we need to tell to both sides of the brains. Um, now you can describe that as cognitive dissonance, you can describe it as hypocrisy. Whatever way it is, it's uncomfortable, I think, to recognize that we know what we should be doing, and we know that we're not doing it. Um, and that perhaps comes back to the previous discussions about how we deal with these sort of these issues um, internally. And one of the ways we've protected ourselves, and I've heard that several times whilst we're here, saying it's not about the individual. I just think that's a very trite response. The individual doesn't exist. The, you know, individual action is system action. There is no separation between the two. So when the individual chooses not to act, that's saying the system's not acting, which actually brings responsibility back home to us because we are, we need, you know, individual and system are just siloed things of the complex world we're in. And they don't exist, they don't actually exist, like physics and chemistry don't exist. So we have to recognize that when we act, that is the system acting. And the, the, 
was it the final one? Yeah, the final one that I felt in the stories, which actually I think would be, was a really sort of positive one, was Benck's proposal. Now, you don't have to agree with Benck's proposal, um, but I think it's hard to disagree with the broad ethos of it, at, le at least, if not everything about it, I think it's positive. But you bring together Benck's proposal with um, Jen, Yen, Jen, the, the politician, who's here. Yen. Jens, sorry. Not very good at pronouncing Swedish names. Um, so we bring together Bengt and Jens. Jens says that if he gets three emails, they start to think that this is an important issue. So how many of us are here? How many people do we think we could get to write an email? So you've got Bengt's stories, and we could write a lot more than three emails. We could probably write 300 emails. Probably if we engaged a few more people in our workplaces, and our friends and our families, 3,000 emails. Now you start to have a movement. So you can actually bring about action from this event. If what Jens is telling you is correct, if they start to get emails about climate change in one form or another, then they will act on that or start to think it's important to, to act on this because votes are behind it, then we can do that. And Bengt laid out a framework within which we might be able to try and do that. So I think there are, there are ways here we can, you know, from this event, we can bring about system level change and action. Um, so the two things, to summarize these, the two things first, I think, in terms of movement and maps, is we need to change our radius. But there are, there's a lot of options in that. There's, there's issues that. There are ways that we can balance that out. But they will be challenging for us. And by us challenging it and doing that, we are changing the system. And the second one is our stories need to escape from Sigtuna. And I think there are ways that they can stay. They need to escape from one side of our brain to the other side of the brain as well. And they need to escape for the, to the, so the engineers and the scientists can hear them. But I do think that when our stories are going to escape, they are heard much better, they are much, much louder, if those stories are told as much by our words, as they are, as much by our actions, as they are by our words. So I think we need to make sure that our actions and our words tell a similar story. And if they don't, I think it's very easy to be unpicked by other people. So change our radius and tell our stories outside of Sigtuna. And I think that was the end of my reflection. Thank you, Kevin. Round of applause. <laughs> so while well, Pat is getting his uh, microphone set up here, um, so our next um, speaker is Pat Yu Wansong, who is a also another friend of CMS. There's a lot of friends of CMS here. <laughs> I realize. Um, a historian of ideas, a human ecologist from Lund, the rivalry university in the city of Uppsala, but now you, you come up here to Uppsala quite often. Um, also a friend of the Sikrana Foundation, I guess uh, not least through the programs you made, the podcast series uh, together with Yerik Schilt that have been recorded, very, quite a few of them here in this, in this very building. And uh, very much looking forward to your reflections. You've not been uh, on the stage yet, so warmly welcome, Pat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I would like to start with uh, very emphatically seconding, seconding what Kevin just said regarding silos. Um, as a f formerly as a researcher and teacher in, in human ecology at Lund University, I was always encountering this problem between the various disciplines, natural science disciplines, social science disciplines, humanities, and which uh, all of them speak different languages and uh, they, they have their silo meetings and they very seldom um, speak to one another. And the problem, basic problem here is actually conceptual and theoretical because we, we have a, a distinct lack of bridging concepts which make sense within the respective silos and not only when, when we meet in, in more informal contexts. Um, so my take on this uh, moment of ref reflection is very much conceptual. I'm, I'm, I'm actually somewhat anal regarding concepts. Uh, I think they're basically the most important tools both intellectually and existentially we have in order to address these kinds of issues. So it's very important not only what words we use, but what we feel and think are behind those words. And the, that, those two um, 
aspects have, have to be uh, intuitively very clearly connected. <clears throat> so uh, I will um, address these maps and movements and told and untold stories by means of some reflections on, on some of the concepts which have figured uh, in various talks here. Uh, of those uh, I have heard, and of course I haven't heard everything. And, and uh, I, I obviously cannot comment on all I have heard either. But <clears throat> let's start with um, two statements made also by Kevin. The first one was um, climate change is different from sustainability. With that I agree. The other concept, uh, or the other statement, excuse me, was that climate change is a small issue, which uh, with that I, I do not uh, agree uh, entirely at least. Uh, to, I see, I very clearly see the point of the statement that uh, climate issue is a small issue. If, if, if we regard it as a, uh, in terms of actions, the action would be to close down the fossil fuel interest, in, industries. And, and, and if, we, if we do that, uh, we, we are very, to, to a significant extent, on our way to solving the climate problem if we view it, view it in terms of the CO2 and other greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, so in, in that very particular sense, I, I kind, of, kind of agree that it is a small issue because what is really physically, what really physically needs to be done is rather clear. <clears throat> also it is, and this is more insidious in it's a way of making climate change seem manageable, which maybe it isn't, despite of this apparent clarity regarding action. Um, and having thought a, lot, a bit along that line, I, I associated this with the concept of hyper-object. If we see climate change as an hyper-object, which means that we are more or less constitutionally unable to fathom it, then it cannot be a small issue. And regarding sustainability, one reason uh, I think that it's quite correct to say, uh, above all, conceptually, that climate change is different from sustainability, is that I think that the concept of sustainability is, uh, is an oxymoron, really. <clears throat> It, it's completely not a useful concept and should pro preferably be abandoned altogether. It's only a rhetorical device, and it's a rhetorical, rhetorical device which clouds our thinking all the time. <clears throat> Sustainability to me can only realistically, realistically mean that uh, the maintaining of status quo, economically speaking. And this status quo is what is causing the problem. So once again, in, in this sense, it must be correct to say that sustainability is different from climate change. Now, what is the real cause of climate change then? Well, on, on, one, on, on the physical level, it's obvious. It's CO2 and other greenhouse gases. gases. But uh, there are, I would say, there are other climates than the physical ones. I would say that the physical climate change is a consequence of a very specific emotional, intellectual, and spiritual climate, which is just as real, ontologically speaking, as the physical climate. And it is actually this emotional, intellectual, and spiritual climate which causes the physical climate change problem. And because of this then, unfortunately, I don't think that climate change is a small issue. Furthermore, regarding, regarding the importance of concepts, um,
again then, if climate change is an unfathomable hyper-object, this means, among other things, that we do not have the language to describe it to ourselves properly. That, what, that is what unfathomable means in, in practice. And uh, in this respect, I found Vanessa's distinction between gut, heart, and head intelligence useful. It is our gut and heart intelligences that tell us that climate change is a horrible thing. But our heads aren't really used to think about horrible things. <clears throat> so, uh, in regard to Vanessa's talk then, which I uh, found quite inspiring for the most part, I find that I was with her in my guts and in my heart, but unfortunately not entirely in my head. And this, uh, to me, has, for various reasons which I cannot go into because it will, will, this will turn into a long lecture and that, that's not what, I, what, what I'm supposed to do. But I don't think that the term, just to focus on one, one thing, which is, to me, uh, perhaps the most important conceptual issue, uh, I don't think that the term and concept of justice works at all as a catch-all concept because to me it has no analytical value and nor lacks analytical rigor. Um, as I said, this could turn into a lecture uh, detailing what I actually mean by, by this criticism. Um, but let's move on. Um, regarding told and untold stories, <coughs> Someone, I, 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 I forgot who, spoke about failure of imagination regarding what is possible. Possible to do and possible to think. I think that one reason for imagine, Im, what, what shall I call it? Difficulties of the imagination? Imaginary difficulties? No. <laughs> uh, difficulties of imagining different kinds of being, different kinds of actions, different kinds of thinking. This must relates to, relate to the thinking and the actions connected with economic, political and technological matters. It is within these fields that we seem unable to imagine something apart from or different from the reigning emotional, intellectual, and spiritual climate. So we are, we are boxed in, in a certain way of, of looking at things, a certain way of feeling, a certain way of intellectualizing and, 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 and thinking. So why is this so? Because I think, as individuals, it is not very difficult, actually, to think differently, to imagine differently. And many of, 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 of the kinds of people who attend these kinds of conferences are quite good at this. Changing perspective, seeing from other points of view, imagining other possibilities. So there is, there is a, a sort of discrepancy between this obvious individual ab ability, on the one hand, and the collective inability to do the same thing. So what is, the, what is the reason for this discrepancy? That is one of the things I've thought about a lot as a human ecologist when I try to conceptualize how you could understand the interactions between artificial systems and, and natural systems. <coughs> and uh, my very short answer then would be to this question regarding why, why this discrepancy between the individual ability and the collective inability. Uh, I would say that it is because the emotional, intellectual and spiritual climate which I've been referring to, that is in fact modernity, 
is an externally realized, physically existing artificial ecosystem which 24-7 conditions us to feel and act in certain ways, whether we want to or not, whether we like it or not, or whether we agree with it or not. And to me, this is the real horror of the situation. We, th we actually live, literally live, within a very specific and actually physically existing kind and means of enchantment, which is very difficult to wake up from. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Isak Stoddard. My name is not Malin Östman, uh, which should have been moderating this conversation. She's unfortunately not feeling too well right now. so. Um, I've been asked to uh, moderate this panel on short notice, so I'm very happy that I have such qualified panelists that will help me, <laughs> so it won't be such a hard job to, 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 to moderate this, I hope, at least. I think also um, it's a really nice way to start this conversation through a story. I think we maybe get back to that through the, through the conversation together here. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, some of those that are new to our gathering today. There's some new faces here today, so... Um, we have a workshop uh, after this, a few of us, uh, with some participants from Climate Existence and some external people <laughs> that have arrived today. So I'd like to just warmly welcome uh, those that have arrived for today and we'll sort of catch the end of the conference and also bring that forward into the smaller conversations that we'll have this afternoon. Um, so my name is Isak Stoddard, as I said, and I thought maybe for those of you who are new also, we'll just uh, make a very brief and very quick presentation. Just basically say your name. And then we'll go through, and you've already heard, I think most of you have heard from Padalai and from Pad and, and Kevin this morning as well, so, uh, but we'll go through here. So we have... I'm Pella. Hello. I'm Anya. This is also a mic check. Yeah. No? Yes. Yes? I'm Vanessa. I'm Per. And I'm Kevin. Good. And we were sort of improvising here. I should also say that Mark Palermo, who was in the, um, in the program to be part of this panel as well, he uh, also was uh, unfortunately uh, had to cancel his, his trip here, So, as we mentioned earlier. So instead of Mark, uh, we in invited Vanessa up on stage here. So we'll have, we thought there was some interesting thoughts that came up in your reflections also that connected to, to Vanessa's talk earlier. So we thought that would be a nice, nice addition. So you're replacing Mark and I'm replacing, you're the new Mark <laughs> and I'm the new Malin in this Bye, conversation. Vanessa. <laughs> so for those of you who weren't here for the last session, what, what we heard was three reflections on the theme of the, of the conference, of, but specifically uh, on movements and maps, told and untold stories of the future. And I'd like to start by asking those of you who didn't have a chance to offer your reflections already to do so now. So uh, Anya and Vanessa, um, and maybe starting with, uh, well, it could be a general reflection from the conference or things that have come up for you that you'd like to share with people here, but maybe also share with us if you have any thoughts on this idea of, of both sort of the maps you use to navigate these sort of issues and maybe also the movements, the actions that you do. If you have any thoughts on that, maybe we can start with Anja, if that's okay. Um, I and also like say a little bit more who you are, because some people are not. I'm the president of the Youth Council at the Summer Parliament. And I have uh, grown up in a reindeer herding family. So the reindeer husbandry is my everything, practically. And I really like that you and the Kevin and Pella talked about family and kids, because that's what I can relate most to. Everything you do in the Sami culture is because of the, your parents and the ancestors, but also everything you do is for the next generation. So that's where I stand in this. Mm -hmm. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> I will come up with more later. <laughs> Um, I think what's coming up for me is the, the story of Chiran. Um, when I started my presentation, there were pictures of the murals in Chiran. And uh, the story that, um, that is emerging from there is from Rosalind, who is a chamana. 
in, in Chiran, a medicine woman. Chiran is a, has a very interesting, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it's, uh, it's, it would take too, too long, but Chiran in 2011 had an uprising against the loggers, the cartels, and the government. And they are one of the, a community, an indigenous Purepecha community in Mexico that has now self-governance. Relative self-governance, it's a very interesting example to talk about, to talk about Sharan, but that's, that's an, uh, they kicked out the cartels, the government, and the, and the um, police, they have their own police now. Um, it's, it's what's important to know about the context of Rosalind, who is the chamana there. And what, I visited her in March uh, because she asked me to be there, and um, she just show this to the people who were at the table with her, because for them it's very important to spend time cooking and being together. And she said, what is this? And she was talking to somebody who was by my side. And the person said, of course, it's a mobile phone. No, 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 look deeper. Uh, okay, so it's a device that is controlling our lives. Look deeper. Okay, it's, um, it depends on extraction. She said, you're on the right track. It's, um, and he, it went on for a bit. In the end, she said, this is the blood of Mother Earth. This is, um, this is the blood also of the communities um, that are, are being affected by the blood minerals that are in this uh, device. And then we, we were just standing there. And then she said, well, what do you do with it? And then the, the person by my side said, maybe we should stop using it. And then she said, why would you do that? So you have uh, this incredible resource in your hands now that can connect you with so many people and interrupt the climates that you're talking about, interrupt the effective economies, interrupt the intellectual economies, the spiritual economies that are creating the problems of the blood minerals, of the, the communities that are being affected. She said, if you have any responsibility and any commitment as you're using it, you have to remember the costs uh, the externalized costs of producing this, not only for the community, but, but for Earth itself, but also see it as a gift. A gift that you use, and the time that you use it to sustain yourself in the struggle, you have to remember why you're using it. You have to use it with the intention of interrupting those economies, interrupting those ways of being that are creating the problem itself. So I'm saying this because it's a very different idea, I think, of how we should relate to what um, the benefits, I think, of modernity. I, it really um, made me think a lot about my own relationship, uh, I think, with technology, but it also made me think about um, the differences between us relating to this or to flying or to oil or to food from a high-intensity struggle and from a low-intensity struggle perspective. So I think this, this story for me makes me wonder, and I'm, I'm ambivalent about flying. I feel bad about doing it, but when she calls me, I'll go. I won't be able to think about whether or not I'm using this or that, because I think I'm doing what she's asking me to do, which is to interrupt the climate, and I think I'm bringing that story back. But the in, the, the, I, I have a problem with no flying as an option, when this option become a mar becomes a marker of universality and of a specific form of arrogance, of moral superiority and justice arbitration. Because this arrogance has a historicity. It's not just spatiality and speed, uh, which, what was the, that we have to talk about. We have to talk about the politics of it, the hegemonic tendencies and the historicity. And then maybe issue the invitation in a different way to the other bodies that are out there that we don't consider when we, we think about the universality of the population. So from the house, from a white male perspective, we tend to think that everybody will accept uh, the position of us arbitrating for others what justice means and what should happen, what everybody should do. And it would work for certain people, I'm not saying, and for certain people it might actually uh, provide benefit, even common good benefits. I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's um, not useful, too, in a certain context. But there are contexts where this invitation actually is going to, to provoke people to do exactly the opposite, because people don't identify with that position anymore. Right? So some people who see that position as problematic are going to say, okay, you don't want to fly, stay where you are, we don't want you here. 
and we're going to be doing now the work that, that needs to be done. So how do we, my question, I think, is how do we issue invitations that are not uh, from a universalist perspective and that can take account of these different sensibilities and how we are perceived, how, how can we read and be read from this low-intensity, high-intensity struggle in ways that bring people together, but not through moral supremacy or authority, through uh, maybe an invitation to exist differently. Um, that doesn't sound like colonialism over again. That's what I think I'm, I'm reflecting right now. Thanks, Vanessa. I think we'll, we'll hold that, that, <laughs> that issue, and I think we'll get back to it. I think uh, Pat might have something to say here, it seems like. But I think I'd like to go back to Anya um, and ask you about the second part of, of the, the title of this, this dialogue as well. So, uh, told and untold stories of the future. Um, are there any of those that you can think of that you'd like to share with us? Told and untold stories. Or of the untold. Future. Or, or untold. Yeah. Of the f future or the past. Well, Sweden in, Swedes in general know very little about Sami culture. I think you know more about indigenous people in USA. And I think that is one old untold story for you to dig deeper in and thereby help the Sami community to strengthen their rights. Mm -hmm. But the whole future is an untold story. And the only thing we can do is hope and do predictions and believe. And I have a strong belief that someday the future will be better. I don't know what more to say. <laughs> There's an endless um, hope in the Sami community because we all want to live and we all want to pass on our history and all culture to our future generations. May I comment on, on, on what Vanessa just said? I think the uh, one very important point you brought up is the tendency to um, universalize and, and totalize certain perspectives, ways of speaking, way of, ways of existing. And um, this uh, I've come to realize during a conversation at the break here uh, because of my uh, criticism of the con use of the concept of, 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 of justice. And uh, uh, Karim, who is here, some, here somewhere, explained to me that uh, you have to distinguish between different concepts of justice, uh, among, other, uh, among others, uh, distrib distributive justice and restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And I realized during that conversation that the reason I was critical to the totalizing of the concept of justice was that I was without being actually aware of it myself, uh, uh, automatically thinking in t terms justice. of uh, distributive justice. And in that sense, it, could, it didn't make sense to me to speak about cognitive justice or ecological justice. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't conceptualize it at all. But, but uh, uh, when now I uh, was helped <laughs> to think about it in terms of uh, the, um, restorative justice, it, it makes much more sense. And this actually relates very specifically and, and concretely to, to what I think we were getting at, uh, at regarding uh, the totalizing and universalizing perspectives. Because uh, actually what I myself has, have been doing for many years as an historian of ideas and, and, and a kind of philosopher is to uh, restore the importance of others, other and older, in my case, ways of thinking about life and about human beings. And, 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 and the, way that, with the way to accomplish this, I think, is to uh, establish contexts of conversation, contexts of engagement, contexts of meeting, in which we actually learn in some cases, force ourselves to listen to another point of view, another, an, another way of conceptualizing the world. Because I, th I think the meeting on those terms is the practical way of finding these new untold stories and the cracks in the modern 
carapace or enchantment, as I, I, I called it. Okay. Pella, would you like to comment on any of this? Yeah. Um, um, so, and, and that's difficult. I think um, th that's what we have been hearing here again and again, that we need to be in the dark. We need to be in the uncertainty. And that's very, very uncomfortable. Uh, and uh, and, and need, we need a lot of humility to do that. And I think uh, also learn and, at, as we have spoken about, the need for unlearning to question the assumptions we have, which is even more difficult than learning new things. And that, that um, yeah, yeah that's, that takes a lot of space holding to, to, to hold us, um, to keep us safe in that space, I think. Um, I also wanted to reflect on, on what you said about flying, that I think is really interesting and applies to a lot of things. Uh, the, the intention behind what we do. So why do we do what we do? Who are we when we, when, we, when we make the choices we make? Because that's sort of what I wanted to say in my uh, speech is that uh, there's a lot of, because of uncertainty, there is hope. Because then we can make an intention, we can make a choice to move that uncertainty in a, in a direction. Uh, and I think that's a practice, actually, uh, that one can have to give some attention to your intention. Kevin, would you like to comment on any of this? I think colonialism occurs within as well as across groups. Mm. So... I mean, the focus, if we bring the focus on flying, flying is just emblematic. I mean, that's, it's, it's a fly, sorry, flying is just emblematic um, of high consumption lifestyles of an elite, with a few exceptions, probably very few exceptions. It is also an extractive industry. Wherever you are, when we fly, we are extracting from elsewhere the carbon sink. We are extracting the right of life of other people elsewhere. And we have to remember that. So whether we're from an indigenous community, or an, I mean, aren't we all? We're all from indigenous communities one way or another. Um, then you know, we, we have to recognize that we are new extractive industries when we are, are carrying out these activities over and above a certain reasonable level of scale that we can spend time defining what that looks like. So it is not a free good. When we choose to do something, we are actively choosing, if we have that knowledge or understanding, to impose something on others. Now, that doesn't, say, doesn't mean to say we shouldn't do it, but we should do it with an awareness. We shouldn't do it within any sort of couched framework that, that I am part of a group that allows us to do that. And I think that, that raises then opportunities to think differently. In the end, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of discussion in this, in this event, quite rightly, on indigenous knowledge. But what we must not do is then say that other forms of knowledge are not valid. Mm -hmm. So if I go to a science event and they dismiss indigenous knowledge, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. If I go to an event and they discuss indig indigenous knowledge and dismiss science knowledge, mm -hmm. that's also wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a risk that we can fall down that trap. As I said before, colonialism occurs within groups as well as across them. I agree with you, Kevin. And, and the thing is, I. You don't need that one. The, no, <laughs> 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 okay. I agree with that, actually. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> I don't like the Madonna. No, oh, but I have to turn it off. Um, I think part of the problem is that what you see as, a, as the cause, other people see as a symptom of a, of a deeper problem. And they want to then address that cause in ways that would probably be contradictory to just addressing the symptom. And putting it all together is what we, we need to do, but at, and that goes back, I think, if I, I, I may go back to the Sami issue, having a, a, a Sami parliament within a bigger parliament but that has no mandate is the way that it 
we have engaged with this no other knowledge so far, mm. right? So the tokenistic way of bringing another form of knowledge into an institution is like, the, the, the metaphor we use in Canada is that um, science knowledge, enlightenment knowledge works like layering of bricks uh, into a, a skyscraper. And the, the, the further you go up, that's the metaphor, right? And, and the sense of achievement is like that. Uh, whereas indigenous knowledge, and this is just one metaphor that could be used, could be seen as seeing reality not as a skyscraper, but as a circle in, in, in weaving rather than laying and layering bricks. And we, when we want to bring it into academia, it's like turning that textile into a brick and just putting it in the wall. Right? And then there's no mandate, it, you just go up there. And then people keep saying, you're not listening. <laughs> and then people say, but you're there. How come we, yeah? The, then the other thing that happens is because of the authority and legit, legitimacy, credibility and validity of the skyscraper, sometimes in the community, then we start building skyscrapers with textiles as well. And that changes the way the community itself relates to knowledge. So it's, it's a, a problem that is, I think, more profound. Same thing with art and what I've seen in arts and humanities. When we're brought into the conference, we're told either to entertain or to explain in their language how this is. And there's no, because there is this differential, of, hierarchical differential of um, significance or perceived importance or significance, we never get to have that conversation that you're talking about, where we, we have to de-universalize both and, and, and talk about the principle of indeterminacy to see how we can braid it together. But we're not there yet because there's no integrity in this relationship yet. We haven't got to the point of integrity. And the integrity would mean taking seriously what some auto autonomy already is a problem, right? The idea of talking about autonomy and sovereignty are already concepts borrowed from the skyscraper. Mm. But at least if we talk about that, we can create a space for integrity where there's less tokenism for the indigenous knowledges. So we, we are, we're still, I think, peddling in the, the creation of the space. But um, if we, that's why I, I didn't say that my question now is, what is the invitation? I'm not against bringing all of this scientific knowledge about flying and extractivist industry to the table. We also need to bring the knowledge that extractivism is a symptom of a climate that is to do with a way of being and that other people want to address that. But we need to issue the invitation for the table in a different way. That, is the, that was the point. How do we make it sound like we are all interested in, in being together, in walking and breathing and dancing together in this path, which is a foggy road, right, without under, knowing where we're getting to, and where we can understand that different people will have different aspirations and different analysis of the problem, which is not a problem in itself. Right? We can actually be together, but if one group decides to take moral authority over the other, this is not going to happen. And this is what has been happening historically, and we can't forget that history. There's a weight of history and a density of history that comes across, whether we like it or not, in, your concept of, in, in reading the concept of justice as liberal justice or distributive justice, was a way of, it, it's just a slip, it just goes there, right, naturally. And then for us to be actually invested in interrupting the satisfaction we have with that is another step. And it's a, maybe it is the commitment, too. So maybe the commitment involves an invitation to a commitment to interrupt it, interrupting the satisfaction with universal authority. How do we do that? And we know it is a loss. But in this loss, there is a gain. So you, you, ex you were talking about exchanging the, uh, the, the position of being at the top in having to defend why you are at the top for a relationship, for as a transactional, which is again a language of the skyscraper. Because in the, in the other side, that's not even a question, right? But if we need this transitional language, that's fine. Let's, um, let's exchange and surrender the universality or the, uh, the uh, universal authority for a relationship that is uh, more open and that allows us to grow together and not to remain within our silos that are about colonialism, internal and external to ourselves and create the cracks so that we can 
realize we are in each other. And, and, there's, and we can work together, but not like the Sami parliament, right? So I think it's emblematic, actually, of how, how <laughs> we have been um, wanting, wanting other ways of knowing without wanting their ways of being. I agree very much with what you're saying. <laughs> but I'm thinking of this with traditional knowledge from indigenous people um, connected to how to reach to the rest of the society. In indigenous communities, the kids are often left with the grandparents. Mm -hmm. And there's an interaction between them. So I think one easy way to reach an older population, for example, in the rest of the world, is to teach the kids how to treat and prevent from climate change. And then they will learn their grandparents how they should act. So I think they're, by studying indigenous knowledge and indigenous traditions, uh, colonialism might learn something and can implement it themselves. Or actually maybe, maybe not teach the kids so much. Because, I mean, the wild mind I was speaking about, which is also I mean, where, the, where the, the gut intelligence and the heart intelligence is, is vital parts, maybe the most vital parts. Uh, kids have, I mean, they, they are less domesticated than the rest of us, I think. So maybe we should not teach them so much. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we'll open up for a few questions from the audience to bring in, uh, and then we will continue the, the dialogue, and then we'll try to wrap up. So uh, maybe a few questions. Will anybody like to ask a question? Absolute. Um, maybe somebody can help me also, or I can do it as well, but uh, you can help. Yeah, uh, I'm looking back to 2008 and how the discussion was then and then seeing that the, this is a great shift of uh, talk in terms of bringing in in a much more serious way the indigenous knowledge and uh, emotional knowledge. And uh, it's like, you know, we have to process this in our gut when we come home. <laughs> but uh, this is a bubble, a little bus we created here together so I would like you to reflect on how this kind of discussion could be carried out in a society which is now in Sweden, at least, going in total different direction, where we are talking about you know, how to exclude other, not integrate, uh, we're not talking about uh, environment. So you know, how to look at this is in, a, in a bigger context. I think we'll start with that question, and then we'll take another one. Um, who would like to start? Pella, yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I think, so, so for me, um, this space work as um, a place where I get permission to see the miracle, um, or, or to, to hear that story that I need that us to tell. So again, the unlocking that René Lertzman spoke about. So maybe not so much to think about how to, you know, push that outwards from here, but rather to, or for me it works as a, a, a yeah, a permission, a um, sort of grounding in that, yeah, this story can exist. It's there, it can be heard. I can tell it, other people also tell it. Um, and that's the way I think it works. I don't know if it was in intelligible. <laughs> I think what you're actually asking in, in practice is how, how do we establish way, ways of conversation across silos in actual contexts, meeting contexts where it matters and this, to me, connects to something Kevin said regarding uh, yeah, at the science at the science conference at the science science conferences. You do not speak uh, 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 about emotional and 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 spiritual issues, for example, 
as a rule. And in, in, in more uh, artsy contexts, you do not, as a rule, speak about um, scientific issues. And what is more, there are seldom artists or, and the like present at scientific conferences uh, in ways that matter. Uh, they, they may be present as entertainment. And, 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 and sort of reverse on the other side. I think that what we actually need to strive for, and those of us who are able and know people from various contexts, uh, have to create occasions in, in, in public spaces in which people can meet in order to listen to one another and not to solve problems not to have discussions, not to teach uh, one another things, but just listen. Sitting, sitting in, 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 a, in a half circle or something, and, and the scientist listens to the artist, the artist listens to the science and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, not in order to come to a conclu conclusion, not in order to, to, to agree on, on, on anything, but just to, to start learning to listen to one another, because uh, that, uh, that is what I, I think we have actually unlearned in, in modern contexts, to, to listen. We are, we, are, we are very, very fond of preaching to one another. Often with microphones, too. <laughs> I, think, well, I think that preaching occurs both verbally and through, through the deafening roar of our silence as well. So uh, preaching is not just the words, but actually it's the absence of words. Um, this may, I mean, just think about this as we're discussing these issues. So this is, this is just a, a, a thought that's come to my mind, actually, in that there's this tokenism towards indigenous forms of knowledge. But actually, when I mean, think about it, there's actually also now, very strongly in my experience, a tokenism towards what science tells us. So they are both being treated in a tokenist fashion. And the reason I'm saying that is actually... What the science is telling us are things that are, and I, I'm trying to think what our socioeconomic paradigm, our, you, may, you may want to use the language of neoliberalism. I think these things are helpful and sometimes also dangerous, but this sort of language, in fact, that is the thing that dominates. So we will adjust our science or treat it with tokenism, which is what we repeatedly do now, to make sure it fits within a neoliberal model. So not only is the indigenous knowledge treated with tokenism, but actually, and actually, we probably would, many of us would probably acknowledge that is actually happening, but we will not acknowledge that science is being treated with the, with the same tokenism, which actually, in some respects, is more dangerous, because the science now is being used to legitimate a, a socioeconomic paradigm, a particular neoliberal model, and actually is completely awash with spirituality, or at least with religion, and the religion is one of mammon. The only thing that matters is money. And so we will adjust our science, our assumptions, to give what appears to be an objective assessment that allows us to carry on with a particular model of money. So this may be wrong, but it's just, I'm, within this discussion, I'm thinking actually that the science that I'm engaged with, not just me, but a lot, a lot of scientists engaged with in working between science and policy, that interface now is one of complete tokenism. And in some respects, I think, say, it's more dangerous than tokenism that, we're, that we've repeatedly demonstrated towards indigenous knowledge. With, with the people I work with, who are practitioners, scholars, activists, we have this metaphor of a beach to talk about this issue of scaling up. Um, it's, so it's, imagine the sea, the beach, and some people... So the idea is to invite people into a different way of being. And the different way of being would be learning to breathe water. So some people are just going to put their toe in the water and, and say, oh, nope. The other ones are going to go in, but then just have the the water up to here, and you have to, to feel the, the floor, or, or floating too, but it's still um, very, um, you don't have to struggle. Those who want to go where the water is not, um, you can feel the, the bottom. Some will, will want to remain in the surface, just ducking sometimes into the complexities of it and probably afraid of drowning. And there are those who are gonna dive. So, in the scaling up, we have to think about, if we're going to think about in invitations into different ways of being, getting people to be um, inspired to dive, um, number one, understand that not everybody is gonna want to do that, first thing. 
The second thing, the people who are at the beach, still in the sand, we're going to need different things from the people who are learning to duck. So we, we, we need to at least attend to four different um, kinds of needs and desires in this process. In design, um, learning entities, which is like earth care is one of them, that would issue this invitation at different levels and, and create a pathway into the more, the deeper, the deeper, more complex and um, the, the, the idea of, of learning to breathe is learning to work with impossibilities, right? And uh, turning impossibilities into possibilities. So it's not just a one, um, a single approach to it. We have to be able to sustain those who are in the deep discussions to go deeper because we need, when I have to do translation all the time and work with people in the sand, uh, you have to reduce complexity. You have to work with a very different sensibility, right? And when you do it too long, you get burned out too. So conferences like this where I can actually go deep, as deep as I want to be and learn uh, are extremely important to keep me going. And it has to be probably smaller than like a, a huge, um, I don't know, like thinking about 500 people who I was with, like in, in the, uh, I was in the principal's conference in Australia, where I had to, to issue a different kind of invitation through global citizenship education, but using a very different kind of language. You see what I mean? There is a difference between talking to 500 people and opening myself up and, and exposing my contradictions and so that I can work through them and, and talking about incompleteness as um, Dugold and I were, were, and Teresa were discussing yesterday. We need space for that. We need that space to do the in-breath in order to do the out-breath and the, the outreach work. So when I hear scaling up, sometimes people are thinking, what single project could achieve uh, Everybody could reach everybody. This is not going to happen, I don't think. Also because we don't want to become the new colonial power that's going to take the world. It's about paying attention, I think, and, and doing what's appropriate for the people and the communities you're working with and using the right language. Um, yeah. I agree with previous speakers. <laughs> it was it is the easy answer. <laughs> I have to take this impression and think about them some days. It's a wise comment, I think. Sashiko. Thank you so much. So um, as this is kind of the final session and then the, the topic is uh, moving forward and I'm thinking a lot about how do we move forward, um, or how do we get to a lot of different ideas that um, that has been put forward? And I was thinking about what you, uh, Kevin, said about like, okay, so uh, is this even this, even though this is a transdisciplinary meeting place? So what perspectives are we missing? Uh, where are the scientists? Where are the technology people? I was also missing a little bit about uh, kind of a political. Uh, so, so there's been mentioning about policy but still in this realm of uh, a, a given political uh, design. So I was, I was inspired by what you were saying about how the Swedish parliament exists and then there's the Sami parliament that has no mandate. Um, and so I'm really interested in how we could redesign political institutions because I definitely think the lack of listening that you were mentioning, the, the silos that were mentioning, like we just can't take the, the democracy as we know it as granted anymore. And this is something that I was thinking about, if, if any of you have anything to say about, because we talked a little bit about, or we talked a lot about the individual, the collective, but if we talk about the structural, the societal, a little bit more concretely about political institutions, if you have anything to say about that. I think we'll catch one more question from Nora here also. Um, I, I wanted to respond to uh, a couple of things, and one is this this idea of an invitation that speaks at another level. And um, I think one of the interesting things that's come up around the Me Too, um, which 
just for the record, that's not like it's my thing or anything, but I just it's a it's an interesting entry point because it's an entry point that is exposing um, assumptions and habits that lead to exploitation in all directions. Um, so it's a, it's important to pay attention to it. Um, but one of the 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 questions that I've been working with around this is how do we really address the kind of deeply marinated trauma um, that, that everyone's in? Of who are you supposed to be? How are you supposed to live? What does it mean to need to be, you know, the, the, the successful male or the, you know, how have we, we're all reflecting and in this m many orders of reflection into this trauma. And to try to think of, well, what would the new rules be is absurd, actually. It's absurd. Um, and so it becomes, again, this question of an invitation of recognizing we don't know how to do this. We actually have no idea. But what we do know is that it matters. That I want, you know, I want you to want me to want you to want me. You know, that... <laughs> That thing is like, it, it, it's, it runs deep. And even if I don't, if we mess up, mm -hmm. at least it matters. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I am resonating also, Kevin, with the way in which science is mocked in this. Mm -hmm. And so often in these threads, you, you're, everyone's gonna think I'm a Me Too person, but I'm not. Um, yeah, I mean, you <laughs> Well, because my work is in ecology, it's... Like you're excusing the feminist issue in this case. Absolutely, I'm so not there. I just don't want to be pigeonholed. It's okay to say me too is hot anyway. I'm writing on it and working on it, and, and it's so important to me. Um, and I'm aware of the silos that these issues get rabbit holed in, and that's what I'm avoiding. Not the feminism, just the rabbit hole. So the, the way in which science gets brought in to say things like, well, you know, it's scientifically proven that women have fewer orgasms than men, or that it's scientifically a, a fact that men have to plant the seed or, you know, that there's this way in which science gets brought into this discourse that completely silences the complexity and the, the, the reflected traumas back and forth and make it so hard to get to the next level. And that doesn't mean that science is wrong or that we don't need science. But the, the, like you were saying, the tokenization of it is dangerous because it has a kind of authority and credibility and voice that is um, hard to get around right now. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of bring those together of this, this question of it matters mm -hmm. and it is starting there. Yaron had a question. Then we'll get. I hope you're taking some notes because we're going to ask you some, ask you to answer these questions later. Thank you. I want to also touch on the subject of uh, how to issue the invitation, and how in the process not to get burned out yourself, because I think the position from where you're uh, able to issue an invitation at all has very much to do with how you are grounded yourself, how you are maintaining in the storm. And I have this image, which is the image itself, the metaphor is a paradox in the sense that it comes from being in an airplane. <laughs> and I got it from Joanne Halifax. And it is this image that you get in an airplane that if there is a crisis, that these oxygen masks may come down. Mm -hmm. And then you get the advice, please put the oxygen mask first on yourself before you put it on a child or somebody mm -hmm. else. And this image, uh, Joanne Halifax works with people in palliative care, so in the process of dying. And she says, to be able to do this, you first need to take care of yourself. Only then you can do this work. Only then you can issue a meaningful invitation. 
Thanks for those questions and comments. Um, I think what I'll do now is we have about, well, about 10 minutes. And um, so this is, it's 10 years ago that we had the first Climate Existence Conference. And this is the fourth Climate Existence Conference. Um, who knows how many, if any, more will happen. I think, as I think I mentioned yesterday, I think unfortunately these questions are not going to disappear in our lifetime. And as it's looking now, they're, they're going to get worse. So with these sort of reflections, comments coming in from different parts of the room, and then when we maybe have just a, a round of, of sort of responses to that, but also maybe I'd like to add one as well, just to make it even more complex. Not complicated, but complex. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, if you like, you could comment on uh, what you would hope we would not be talking about 10 years from now if we organize another climate existence conference. And you can leave that question or you can, you can pick up on it. But I, there was many rich questions coming from the audience here as well. So feel free to pick up on any of those when you, when you make your final remarks in this session. And um, yeah, who would like to start? Anybody feel ready? <laughs> Adelaide, it's good. You're always ready. That's great. It's nice that you're next to me here. That's good. Yeah. It feels good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah I want to speak to what you just said, Jan, and what also Sashiko touched upon uh, and, and others, that we have this idea that so we need to do, we need to, to, to affect the world, we need to change something, we are in a hurry, we need to get things done. It, it has to be done outside of this building. And I'm a bit sick of that idea that we are beating ourselves up for what we didn't, what we didn't do for the people who are not here um, to listen. I think um, that uh, I think it 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 matters. It matters that we gather here, um, and we can be sort of very stressed by that. That few people are as aware as we like them to be, um, and we can be um, stressed about what Nora said that these enormous patterns that we have to go through the trauma how can we all go through that trauma i mean that 's impossible really, uh, and I think that also the what what 's true is that actually we don 't. All of us doesn't have to be that aware. All of us don't have to go through that trauma. It matters that few of us do that. It's important. It's important that we gather here. And who knows from those four conferences what was you know, put out in the world. I remember reading an article from the first conference that Peter wrote. Uh, and Peter and I, we have been working together since 2009. I don't know if that happened because of that article. I mean, but something happened. It influenced me. Um, yeah, maybe that's enough. Um, my answer to this quest question is that we need to talk. We need to talk about how we feel and our thoughts about the future and also talk uh, about the climate change because if we talk we communicate and by communicating we can involve other people and also exchange ideas and get new experience and I hope we're not talking about climate change in 10 years <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, otherwise I don't know I don't like fossil fuels so I hope we have come up with some new ideas about how to travel the world and take us from A to B I I am sort of at a loss for words, um, actually. Um, but I think uh, one thing that Pella brought up is is very much more important than we sometimes realize, because we are. I think we are conditioned too much uh, 
in, in this kinds of semi-public context, we're conditioned to, to think in terms of impact in a sort of media way. And, and I think that's, that's really, really wrong and, and bad and even sometimes evil. Um, well, why not? Um, I, 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 so, so you never underestimate the importance of getting people from different kinds of work and context together and just mixing them up and having them, them sit down and react to, to one another uh, over lunch or, 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 or in the evening or, or just listening. Uh, because my, my experience, professional experience, is that everything which I have, which isn't very much, uh, what, what I've managed to do the, that I know have, ha has had some kind of impact on others, uh, everything of that has been because of these seemingly chance meetings. And I also think your point um, about being grounded in yourself in order to, to be, be able to, to sort of spiritually, if you will, metabolize the trauma you were speaking about, the collective trauma, is also very important. So, so uh, from the point of view of arranging these kinds of conferences, uh, I think the, the, to, to, to kind of sort of establish an an atmosphere of, 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 of trust and, and joy and, and, and just... It's not so, not so important to being right or, 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 being, or being important. It's not important to being important. That, that, uh, uh, th these kinds of th things, we, we, don't, we don't really have to conceptualize them or think about them very much. We just, just need to do it. And that actually ties into your question regarding policy and politics, because p policy and politics, as it works, uh, uh, and has worked for a very long time, act uh, actively discourages that ki that these kinds of meetings. So we, we, we need to build up, from the bottom up, different kinds of, of, of uh, political structures, I think, in the long run. Just on that issue of impact, I think at the end of the day, I think the system, you, you alluded to this, well, you directly mentioned it, that the idea the system is complex. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can't assess impact. In a complex system, you can't measure these things. So I think the two things you have to do is to recognize that we have to do our work carefully and diligently, and we have to communicate it clearly so we have a responsibility to engage. But the system itself, if it's complex, it is inevitably emergent. So we should not expect to see the outcome of our work, because our work will just percolate through an emergent system and come out somewhere else. In the UK, we're obsessed by measuring everything. We have to measure our impact, which I continually get criticized for by the university, because I don't take a note of any impact things I get involved with, because I just don't care. I, don't think, I think it's meaningless. Um, so all we have to know about impact is that we do things well, we do things carefully, and we communicate them clearly. And that is the end of our responsibility from impact, because it's an emergent system. Going back to the actual questions themselves, um, first, I think we have to have much, much greater respect for our policymakers than we have today. I may disagree with virtually every policymaker I come across, but I, they are trying to do as, mu as, as, as good a job as the rest of us are trying to do in our jobs. And I think we have to have much more respect for them. And I think in Sweden, people have more respect for your policymakers than in the UK or the US. But I think overall, we are too dismissive. We joke about our policymakers as not caring. They care as much or as little as we do. <laughs> we get the policymakers we deserve, as some people would say. Um, but in terms of what we do about how we set up structures of governance, I've always liked the fundamental under, what I see is the fundamental underpinning of the EU, which is the concept of subsidiarity. It sounds like a simple thing, but it's you make decisions at the appropriate level. And this goes back to my comment yesterday about the freedom from and freedom to thing. That if the decisions I make in my household don't affect the people around me, then that's, no one else should tell me what to do. If they, if they, if, I think the Sami parliament should be making decisions that, that are right for you that don't affect other people. When they start to affect other people at any significant level, I think you have to have another tier above that or complementary to it that allows that interplay then between people that are interfered with. 
because you know, a lot of our things. So that, that's why I like the concept of the EU. It's why I'm for, uh, strongly against concepts like Brexit, because I think we do need multi-layered forms of, of governance. At least that's within, within democracies like we have in the West, or at least in the EU. I'm not saying that's appropriate everywhere. So subsidiarity, much more democracy, which is inevitably inefficient. So you know, the, the, the drive towards efficiency often is a real mistake, because individual efficiency gives you collective inefficiency. So I think we need lots of democratic layers. The concept of subsidiarity would provide a framing for governance. This idea about the invitation, um, I think it's if we can invite people, that's really good. But also, I'm, I just we can't be waiting. We can't wait to be invited. I think we have to just grasp the power. We have to just turn up. We have to be belligerent. We have to be difficult. We have to get our bodies in the way. So I'm, I'm not just about polite invitations. I know British people like polite invitations, but you get nowhere with it. You know, the suffragettes, they got votes for women, not because they were polite. They got votes for men in 1965, not because they were polite. So I think politeness gets you so far, but sometimes you've got to be much more belligerent and take the power, you know, struggle. Um, and there was that discussion there about in science, this, I just made the, I'm gonna make, came back to your comment really, that, um, I mean, science is used to shut down the debate, but it's not really science. It's a deliberate misuse of science is used to shut down the debate. So it's not science shutting it down. And the, the real concern I have there is actually, and it's another issue of struggle and belligerence, is that scientists, which are not the same thing as science, scientists have stayed quiet about that. And that is not their job. And they should be sacked as scientists if they're doing that. And, and I would say a large number of scientists have stayed remarkably quiet about how their work is being misused by others to support the current status quo. Um, and I, I liked um, uh, Jan's, Jan's point, this idea that um, before you issue an invitation um, to, you know, to first do it yourself, I think there's something about that that adds a lot of credibility to our work. If we are seen to be doing something broadly in line with what we are suggesting other people do or what our invitation um, alludes to. And what we're talking about in, in, in 10 years' time, I hope, we, I hope we're not talking about how to bring these levels of knowledge into informing future action. I hope we're looking at these other forms of knowledge, which we'll always be arguing about, but actually arguing about these in terms of our experience from the action we have taken. We have taken no action so far. So I hope in 10 years' time, we'll have 10 years of action that we then apply this way of thinking to, to iterating the action for the next 10 years. What's coming to me is two very short stories, but I have to preamble it with the, with an acknowledgement that I have deep respect for people's rights to invest their energy in whatever fantasy they want, in a way, because it's it's an existential thing, right? I cannot decide for others what your existence is gonna look like. That's it's a principle that is different. I can criticize your doing, but I can't criticize your being in a way. I can criticize, for example, the universality of Western thought, but I can't criticize the, the value of it and the problematic value of it and the ignorances of it. Um, I, can, I can acknowledge that, but the, the, the critique is at a different level. So that, with that in mind, um, there's a story that connects the politics with the trauma, which is um, when I was working in all working with the government's uh, policymaking platforms for um, multi-stakeholder policy making about global education in Europe. And one of the groups, one of the platform um, of NGOs was trying to lob lobby the EU to have a hearing on global education, which is about both environmental and social aspects of global challenges. And they, they had made balloons of the earth and put them in a table, at the table at the parliament. And they needed 60 um, signatures. And by the end of the day, they didn't have the signatures. They had only two or four. And then this, this man comes and they, they ask, what party are you? And it was a Polish party, far right, uh, the, the, the politician. And he said, I want that balloon. And then they said, no, you can't have it. <laughs> you can't have the balloon. But I, I, I want the balloon. You have to give it to me. And then somebody had the idea, OK, so get us 45 signatures and we'll give you the balloon. They got 45 signatures from that party to do a hearing which was about something else, right? But a lot of the people who were involved in that group decided to quit because they said if, um, um, 
the liberation in which was what they believed and I was always challenging them to, to go a bit deeper than that in terms of thinking about what compels people to act, including the affective dimension, they, they realized that um, what they had invested their existence in was a fantasy, that that was going to change uh, something. And that was, it's just an example of, of what happened, which is not as positive, which <laughs> is more negative. And then the, on the other hand, you would have um, the rights of Pachamama being written in Ecuador. And at the time of that the rights were being written, there was also a story being circulated that they were being re written, like in Latin America, in, in Spanish it's, or in Portuguese, for gringos to see, right? Because the way of being uh, of that place, the way we respect Pachamama, is not down to a paper that our representatives sign off. It's, you, you, you're not relating to things through a declaration that a representative democratically elected has put their name on. So you don't have respect for that. Your respect for the earth comes from something much deeper and, and, and practices that are not related to politics. So I think I, I'm putting it out there to talk about, like we, we have to inv maybe invest in reforming our institutions, that's part of it. Maybe hacking our institutions, maybe hospicing our institutions, maybe walking out from our institutions. So there, there are different possibilities here, and, and I cannot choose for you what you're going to do, and I cannot say, let's all walk out, because I know that the moment we, we do, uh, there are going to be contradictions and paradoxes and other problems are going to be created. I can respond for myself, and I can respect the path that you decide to take. That's, th that is part of the invitation. And there are times where it is absolutely important to say, let's everybody now it's time to protest so that there is a momentum where we can get something. But I think the more we go into a, a neoliberal form of um, post-national uh, um, financial capitalism, the, the power of the state that we imagine uh, it had when there was a facade of um, uh, us believing that it was about the people, not about property, because nation state was created to protect property. Law is created to protect property. So as long as property is the center of this, and um, there's also the critique that um, civil rights and human rights were only granted uh, as a concession when the rights of people um, converged with the rights of property. Right? Maybe we are coming to a time where this convergence is not going to happen anymore. So us requesting the same thing is not going to have the same effect. So th that's the kind of... We, we need to be working together and listening to each other and, and evaluating these options of hacking, hospicing, walking out, reforming. Uh, as we go along, there's no one single answer to this in respecting the existential choices that we make in investing the energy that we have and the time that we have, which is the only thing we have, uh, really, into what feels, I would say, what we feel called to do. And I think that's... I think that's a good way to wrap up this panel. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for for your comments and reflections, and um, also for those comments and reflection and the listening that you that you've done during this session. Um, so let's give all of us a warm applause. <laughs>